Welcome to the exam room podcast brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. My goodness gracious, my guest today wears so many hats. He is a coach. He is a marketer. He is a heck of an inspiration. He is host of the plant yourself podcast, and he is also co-authored a number of books with some amazing individuals in the health space, including whole with T. Colin Campbell and Proteinaholic with Dr. Garth Davis. So I'm so excited that Howard Jacobson is here with us today on the exam room. My friend, so good to see you. Thank you so very much for making the time to be here. It is my honor. This is a, this is a feather in, in one of my many hats. And, well, I mean, it's a feather in my hat. I mean, I don't know how somebody such as yourself juggles so many different things in life. Like I do this show and I do it to its fullest extent, but you are doing so many different things. So how are, how are you balancing all of your time? Poorly, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, you know I've got yeah, you know, every night I go to bed and I like, you know, have my list of regrets, the things things I didn't get done. Um <laughs> I love the honesty though, man. Oh, this is going to be a good interview. Um, so here's the deal. You are now like firmly entrenched in the plant-based space. You kind of have to be when you're working with the likes of T. Colin Campbell, Dr. Garth Davis, obviously hosting Plant Yourself. Um, you weren't always though eating this plant-based diet whatsoever. As a matter of fact, reading up about you before our interview today, you had written on your website that by the time you were just 35 years old, you were feeling like an old man. What was going on with you? Yeah, you know, it's it's um, it's humbling how many times I had the plant-based message drilled into me before it really took. Um, so I first went plant-based at a young age at, let's say, 25. Um, it was shortly after my father died of a heart attack. And I found John Robbins' book, Diet for a New America, in Barnes and Noble. And for some reason, I was drawn to it. And I read it and I immediately changed my eating habits overnight, I lost, you know, 20 pounds. I, I was the last time I ever fit into size 31 jeans. <laughs> um, and it all made sense. And then like, gradually, I forgot. And by the time my first child was born in 1996, I was back to, you know, dairy. And when she grew, was able to eat solids, we'd get her, you know, organic yogurt, but yogurt nonetheless. I would take her out to Parkway Pizza and, you know, get mad at her if she didn't eat the cheese because, you know, you can't just eat the bread. And it took again until 2004 till, till I read the China study to kind of remember, oh, yeah. And, it, you know, in that point, it was like between 1996 and 2004, when um, my two kids were born, I was basically, they, they called me the basarero, which in Spanish is the garbage man. Like I would just like finish what's on their plates. Like, you know, I don't want to put it away. I don't, I don't want to deal with leftovers. I certainly don't want to throw it out. And man, that looks kind of tasty. It's like, you know, nuggets and things and, you know, kid food. And I had packed on a lot of weight and my cholesterol was up. Um, I had back problems. So it was, it was always, you know, they wanted me to roughhouse on the floor and I had to frequently say no. And I was tired all the time. And the interesting thing was when I went to the doctors, like none of this was abnormal to them. It wasn't like, oh dear, you know, we've got to do something about you. It's like, yeah, you're, you're living the American trajectory. You know, we can give you some pills if you want. Um, I got, I had one, uh, checkup where I got my blood work done and the cholesterol was like 204 and the doctor had written great work. Keep it up at mm. the top. Mm. And so there was, I, there were, I was not getting any feedback that anything was wrong. This was just the way life went. And it was only then upon reading the China study that I kind of remembered, oh yeah, there was this way of eating that like, really worked for me. And I went back to it and again, I, you know, became, uh, lean and, and fitter and started feeling better. And it I'm embarrassed to say that after a few years, that kind of wore off too, because I'm, I'm like a voracious reader. So then I was reading things like, you know, Wheat Belly and, and this, um, this school teacher who wrote these long blog posts about how the China study misinterpreted the data, even though, 
you know, the uh, the epidemiologist who worked on it was like this knighted professional from Oxford University. You know, this this woman knew more than he did. And I gradually started doubting everything. And I'm really embarrassed to say I did not finally make the full time shift into this way of eating until Dr. Campbell asked me to write whole with him. And then I was actually like going into the research as opposed to just like reading people that I liked. And I think we have a big problem in our community in, and I think it's in, in most wellness communities around like the personality and like, oh, I really like this person. So I'm just, you know, they're my guru now. And if we don't actually get in touch with the data and the details and the studies and the facts, we're, we're very susceptible and the, the way I was to whatever siren song or interesting theory some attractive charismatic person was pushing yeah that's a slippery slope in this day and age i think that extends outside of just the health community um but that's another show for another day um i i think that it's interesting though you're certainly not the only person in the world to kind of find something that works and then go astray over time and then you find it again and then you go back astray like in hindsight, do you kind of feel like that was almost self-sabotage or did you just kind of like relax or really was it just the fact that you had seen somebody else's idea and that seemed to fit with how you were feeling on that particular day? So you decided to go down that road. I don't think I'm self-aware enough to answer that question. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, cer I certainly am no stranger to self-sabotage in lots of areas of my life. Um, I think largely it was a matter of um, just being bored. Like there's, you know, our, our minds are always looking for the new thing. And, you know, with with the advent of the Internet and social media and this kind of constant stream of uh, clicks and eyeballs and attention, that I, like everybody else, I can get seduced by the next new surprising idea. And like, am I gonna click on an article that says broccoli is good for you? Like, no. <laughs> will I click on an article that says bacon is good for you? Yeah, that will, gee, wow, that's that's new, right? So our just the way our, our brains are wired to turn anything that we know into background and focus on whatever the delta is, because that implies threat or opportunity just for you know our, our uh, paleolithic brains walking around the savanna trying to stay alive and find food, right? We just, we notice changes, we notice difference, we notice surprise and newness. And I think I became a victim of that, the same as, as a lot of other people. Man, you know, that that clickbait that you were just talking about, bacon is healthy. I'm sure that that headline definitely exists somewhere. It just has to. Part of me thinks that, okay, maybe like this is, oh, this is new. Let me go explore it. The other part of me thinks that, you know, daggone well already that that's clickbait, but you're going to click on it because you have this wishful thinking and you want to hope like heck that in fact it's true. And everything that we've been told about bacon being unhealthy is so wrong. And we should all be eating bacon until the end of time. And that's the key to living a long and healthy life, right? So did what was part of it also like wishful thinking on your part when you were exploring some of this stuff? Possibly. I mean, I really like my plant based lifestyle. I mean, I, and I know, you know, certainly I have friends who are constantly sending me texts with links to, hey, what about this? Here's a new butter article. Or, hey, there's this thing about grass fed beef where it has fewer of these amino acids in it. And they're, you know, or, hey, I just saw an interview with so and so. And, you know, they said such and such. And, you know, so I can, I definitely, you know, in other areas of my life, I definitely like want to engage in wishful thinking. <laughs> and so I, I understand that human tendency. But I think the bigger issue for me is I'm smart enough to think that I'm smart enough to not get fooled by this stuff. And I'm not. <laughs> okay. I'm smart enough to think I'm smart enough not to get fooled by stuff. Well said, sir. Well said. Um, so we talked about your cholesterol. I also want to ask you about another issue that you were having with 
uh, your blood pressure. If I'm correct in understanding, you also had some pretty high blood pressure readings, did you not? I typically have pretty high blood pressure readings, like the way I eat and the way I live and I meditate and I, you know, forgive people like I have pretty high blood pressure, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, just left to my own devices. I have pretty high cholesterol. I think I'm kind of a genetic ticking bomb uh, or, you know, partly genetic and partly also that I was a, a formula fed cesarean baby which in terms of microbiome puts me several strikes behind, as well as, um, you know, some genetic dispositions towards certain conditions. So it's clear to me that I have a very low margin of error. Like even, even when I am perfect, my numbers are not spectacular. Like you would not, you know, put them on a poster for, for plant-based eating. Um, well, so, before, yeah, you know, well, well, I mean, do you still do you feel like, I guess, less of a genetic time bomb now that you're leading this healthier lifestyle? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, I think the, I, I've changed the odds. For um, sure. Second of all, I don't want to be, you know, disabled or on my early deathbed thinking, boy, I wish I had done this differently. Like, I just want to, you know, do what I just want to do what I can, like, the, you know, let the chips fall where they may. And hopefully not in my mouth anymore. But <laughs> basically, um, you know, I I can only control the things I can control. And I suspect, you know, I've I've been you know trying to understand cholesterol. Like honestly, it's too complicated biochemically for me to really get. And there's so much conflicting information out there. But my sense is that cholesterol in and of itself, without the addition of inflammatory food, is less of a problem than the, you know, the LDL small particles when you're constantly inflaming, um, you know, arteries. Um, I can't stand by that. I don't really understand the science that well. But, you know, the basic lesson is like food is so complicated and we really know very, very little. So mm -hmm. if I take the little that I know and try to apply it to my life in a useful way, then I can just you know, sleep easy at night. You're a straight shooter, Howie. I love that, man. You're just a straight shooter. This is how it is for me. And I'm going to tell you, I can respect the heck out of that, man. Um, I want to go back to your diet, right? So you were eating all of the foods that your kids were eating, kid food, as you put it. Um, before becoming a dad, what was your diet looking like? Were there plenty of trips through the drive through a lot of uh, takeout calls to the Chinese place, uh, pizza delivery, all of that good stuff? Yeah, not not drive throughs. Um, I almost never I, I, No, I haven't eaten like, you know, a McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's or Taco Bell probably since I was a little kid um, that that never I, I was always like a, a, you know, a gourmand. Like I knew the difference between, you know, pink slime and like good tasting food. <laughs> um, but certainly, you know, like pizza, I wouldn't go to Pizza Hut. We'd go to De Lorenzo's Tomato Pies in Trenton. You know, we'd we'd get the the great you know old school stuff. Um, yeah, I mean it was it was standard. I loved you know eating and food. I like I've always liked cooking, so oh. it was it wasn't like I was eating a diet you know bereft of vegetables. It wasn't all like you know hungry man meals. Right. Uh, but again, give, given my unique biochemistry, um, I have found that anything anything short of pretty strict um, makes me put on weight and messes with my biomarkers and messes with my energy and mood. All right. So now you just hit on something that I find really interesting, uh, so really strict. OK, I think that when people are talking about shifting their diet, making changes, the term strict can be a real turnoff to a lot of people and make them not even want to go down that road. So you say that you're being strict, but is it I don't even want to use the word intolerable because clearly it's not you and I are here having this wonderful discussion today. Um, how are you learning to live with that strictness without still feeling so confined with what it is you are and are not able to do. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think the word strict does scare people because it sounds like loss and, 
you know, sacrificed and giving things up. And let's face for most people, like a lot of the food we eat um, sort of obsessively out of control that we're struggling with is food that we're eating to modulate our mood. So if, if we're gonna go on a sort of a health kick and I say, oh, well, I'm not gonna have any more sugar or you know, as one of my clients all called it recreational sugar, Right. I'm not or I'm not going to be eating, you know, fatty fried foods anymore. This these, these have always comforted me. They've always made me feel better when I was sad. At a certain point, when we make that decision, you're also making the decision to deal with the underlying emotional crisis that you have been, you know, bottling up. So I don't exactly remember where we were going or what what what's the beginning of this conversation. Are, are you feeling too restricted now with with your diet, right? So how are you operating within these plant based parameters and still feeling plenty fulfilled with your palate, basically? Yeah. Well, what one of the things that I learned and that I teach in my coaching is that there is um, there's a bad math formula that a lot of people try to apply when they want to change a behavior, which is um, I'm going to do something hard and or unpleasant now to get a good result later. And there's something in our brains that discounts later so much that it doesn't matter how great the later thing is. We're almost never willing to in the, for the long term, give up pleasure now or endure pain now. So if I want to be buff, for, you know, a beach wedding. <laughs> and what I have to do is get up and work out four times a week and go to the gym and get up early. Then every morning I'll be like, yeah, it's just a little bit too much effort now. I'll start tomorrow. And so so they just the, the the algebra of it doesn't work out. And so the thing that will actually help us is not thinking about the future goal that we want to reach but thinking about the values that we want to live. So when I wake up in the morning and I think, oh, I just want to sleep in, I don't want to work out. And then I think, what's my value here? The value is keeping my word. The value is taking care of myself. The value is doing something hard for the sake of something that's important to me. That'll get me out of bed. Living my values in the moment is not restrictive. It's not a hardship. So that if I think of my food as, oh, I got to eat this rabbit food, I got to eat all these Neil Barnard approved crackers and celery sticks and ugh, right. That's that's a very short term <laughs> solution. And I'm going to I'm going to backslide. But if I think about what are the values that I that I'm bringing to this, I want to be in control of my life. I want to take care of my body. I want to keep my word to myself. Those, those are positives right now. I don't have to wait six months to, to look like Hugh Jackman. I can feel good right now. And that goodness can over, uh, you know, outweigh the, the, the discomfort or misery that I might feel of having to get up early in the morning and go throw, uh, you know, iron kettlebells around. For sure, man. And, and by the way, to that Neil Barnard, uh, you know, crackers and celery sticks diet, have you seen some of the recipes that are on the Physicians Committee's website? I mean, we just launched this universal meals program, Howie, that has like hundreds of recipes that are like all Neil Barnard approved, but like A plus over the top culinary masterpieces. I don't know how they compare to DiLorenzo's pizza that you were talking about earlier, but I guarantee there's a pizza in that recipe database that you're going to say, Mwah! that is Trey Magnifique, my friend. So right. Good. And I want to make clear that I, I was not speaking literally about oh, that. I know. I right? know. I but, know. You know, as, as, as a human being, Anything that smacks of restriction, I'm going to view through that lens. So, you know, like one, one of the things I do to um, make the world a better place is I'm on a, 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 an ultimate Frisbee team of a bunch of old men like me. And a couple times a year, I'll have everybody over for a barbecue. And, you know, I will produce some healthy meals, you know, absolutely some delicious salads. And I'll, 
I'll make, you know, we have uh, blueberry bushes, so I'll make some, you know, blueberry desserts that are very healthy. But the other thing that I will do is I'll have a big, big pack of burgers and a grill, and they will grill up these burgers, and I will not tell them that these are Beyond Burgers. Oh. And, you know, would I tell people to eat Beyond Burgers to be healthy? Absolutely not. But for people who are used to something else, like coming at it from, oh, this like from a culinary perspective, like, oh, this is good. Starting with, um, you know, with the visceral, as as my friend, the um, award winning chef, uh, Brian Terry talks about, start with the visceral, move to the, you know, move to the intellectual and then to the political. <laughs> right. So um, letting people experience the deliciousness of our diet without before, you know, before we start lecturing them, if that's ever possible, um, is a really good way to break down some misconceptions. That's very good. Let them experience it and then hit them with the knowledge, right? That's the, I like that. I like that. It really does. It kind of takes away that stigma, like helps them drop the guard a little bit. It's like, well, you already ate it. Oh, well, the burger was pretty good. How about that, man? That's pretty cool. Uh, true story about ultimate Frisbee. Number one, I think that it's really cool that you do ultimate Frisbee. Number two, the only time in my entire life that I played ultimate Frisbee, I was still woefully overweight. Like probably about 380 at this point, still smoking like a chimney. And I'm out there like every single one of my pounds, uh, running around smoking a cigarette during the game, like thought I was going to keel over and die with all of the running that was evolved and still, and still went right to the drive through afterward, man. That is kind of the power of the standard American diet. I know that you weren't much of a drive through guy, but for me, the drive through was everything. And despite mm. the fact that I, you know, felt like 10 minutes earlier, I was going to die on that ultimate Frisbee field, still feel the need to go right back to the place that um, was leading me to that early grave, man. Isn't that crazy? Have you, have you, talked about anybody who you work with as a coach uh, who kind of has those similar compulsions to keep doing that even they know even though they know like it is to their extreme detriment I'm trying to think of people who don't have those compulsions mm. and it might not be for fast food which is you know possibly the reason that you were several hundred pounds heavier than I was that you know my my poisons were uh, didn't pack on pounds. But, you know, whether it's a compulsion for a particular kind of food or a mood altering drug or a behavior, uh, you know, I've been struggling with my smartphone for for years. I feel like it's it's got a hold on me and it keeps me from being my best self. Um, there were times where I was on Facebook and Twitter and just absolutely posting. I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Um, <laughs> Not because I'm, you know, necessarily always a terrible person, but because the the platform, the medium almost felt like it demanded it from me. So I think to be human, again, is what I was saying earlier about like not overestimating our power to resist our environment. So when I work with people, I, you know, the assumption is, yeah, you've got compulsions and just saying 20 minutes earlier, well, I'm never going to do that again is not going to work for for hardly anybody, you know, there may be people who are very rare people who have conversion experiences and like all of a sudden they can't imagine having a cigarette again. I've heard about such things or people who have a, an enlightenment experience and all of a sudden they've dropped their ego need to control others or put others down. But for most of us, the impulses still live inside us. And the big thing that I have learned that I offer my clients is to start observing the impulses, develop a relationship with them, and recognize that we don't have to act on our preferences, and we don't have to act on our urges. And there are tools and strategies and techniques for weathering urges and impulses without acting on them. And, we, and, and they take practice. For sure. Uh, I think that with that practice comes the proof that you can, in fact, do that. And with that proof, then comes the sense of power that you have a lot more control over yourself than you give yourself credit for. Um, that is the process. As you said, it, it takes practice, man. But once you kind of refine that and you get good at it, 
uh, it really is a phenomenal feeling. You never want to get cocky mm. because those impulses are always there. But, you know, to this day, I will still get those cravings from time to time for Taco Bell. And I just, as much as I don't like them, I'm also grateful to be able to repeatedly remind myself that you do have control over your eating habits when so many of us feel as though we have zero control over it whatsoever. We're a slave to that standard American diet. No matter what we do, we're always going to be trapped. Just proving to yourself that you can make a healthier decision and live through it. I mean, like, it's just, it's a super empowering feeling. Yeah. And I'm curious for your story, like when you decided to change, whether mm -hmm. you slipped up at any point or whether... It was, you know, once you made the decision, it was um, fait accompli. This, so for 13 years, I have been like fast food sober. Uh, like there's no, no cheat days, no nothing like that. Because I trace back to every failed diet that I ever had. Um, that time where I thought that I could have just one, I would have that one slip up and feel like I would be okay. But that one led to another and another and another. And pretty soon everything had fallen apart and all the way to come back on. And I was just trapped right back there again. It was like that vicious cycle. So what I've learned this time is that like, I, I can live without it. I don't ever have to be cocky and think, oh, well, I can have just one burrito from Taco Bell and be okay. I don't trust myself that I can. What I do trust is that I'm okay without it. I've learned that now for 13 years. And that's just kind of how it works. I kind of call that my one nacho theory because I can think back specifically to one time when I had done really well. I had lost like 70 pounds, Howie. And, and I had one nacho and I thought I would be okay. But that one nacho became a second and a third and a fourth. And even though Honest to gosh, I was working at a Mexican restaurant. That one nacho then led me back to the drive-thru at Taco Bell. That is when the compulsion crept back in. So the one nacho theory is some of us can't have just one nacho. You mm -hmm. have to have no nacho in order to be healthy. So that's right. it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, what comes to me there is like there's lots of different theories about what works. And the only theory that I would be interested in is the one that you stress test yourself. Right. So there are like for you, you have a, you have a theory that you live by that is successful. If suddenly somebody came and told you, actually, that's not how things work. The human brain, blah, blah, blah. Here are these studies, you know, here you, like you would be crazy to pay any attention to that because, yeah. you know, in the, in the end, like even even the best studies, there's never it's never a hundred to zero. It's always like, well, this group did slightly better than that group, or maybe they did a lot better, but there are always outliers. And a few years ago, I was involved in an attempt to to run a clinical trial testing, you know, our um, the, the company I was with, our methodology for getting people to eat healthy. And we were going to do a control randomized control clinical trial with, you know, a hundred people in the experimental group, a hundred people in the control group. And we went, we spent thousands and thousands of dollars and ended up not doing it because it was too hard with the institutional review boards, with trying to get data capture, trying to get um, consent via the internet. And I learned how hard it is to do a clinical trial and how easy it is for you to do your own clinical trial of yourself. So like, instead of waiting for the perfect data, you say, well, what if I tried this for two weeks and saw what happened? Like that's better data oh, <laughs> than yeah. you're going to find in any medical journal. Oh yeah, man. Like people ask me what my secret is all the time. And I, I tell them this is what worked for me. Right. So that's how I always preface it. But there's also the reminder that I give to these people, like there are 8 billion people in this world and there is no such thing as a one size fits all. That said, the caveat to that is there are some basic parameters that I also believe in that can work pretty much universally. Okay. So we know universally a plant-based diet is by and large the healthiest way that we can eat. Right. But there are then specific studies that can really kind of really help to refine things for us, right? So let's say there's a study that says, well, if you eat onions every day, 
you will live 10 years longer, right? But what if you hate onions, right? Well, there's another study over here that says that if you eat beans every day, shout out Dan Butner, you will live those 10 years as well. I think it was like eight years, but whatever. It's a long time, okay? Bottom line is you have to find what works for you within those kind of universal parameters. And there is a lot of space within there to really find what works for you. So it's a plant-based diet, but in my case, it's Chuck's plant-based diet. In your case, it's Howie's plant-based diet. And if it's a specific exam roomie, it's the specific exam roomie's plant-based diet. It goes right back to what it was that you were saying. You have to find what works for you. Absolutely. And you know, it's, it's empowering. Yeah, because um, it it again when I was talking earlier about my you know me hitching my wagon to all these different gurus, uh, what I wasn't doing was taking responsibility for running my own experiments. Um, yeah. So man. you know, and that's and that's available to anyone. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Uh, I got to ask you here with the time that we have remaining, uh, you you have written uh, a book with two people whom I really admire a tremendous amount. Uh, number one, Dr. Garth Davis, a uh, proteinaholic. I mean, this book is legendary within the health community now, man. Um, what was your experience like working with him? Oh, he is so much fun. Um, he's, he's a very chill, laid back guy with very strong opinions. And so it was, you know, it was wonderful to, I mean, you know, he, by the time I started working on the project, he already had, you know, 700 references and kind of an outline. And we would just kind of go back and forth. And I, I eventually went down and it was it was just really fun. Um, you know, he's he, he lives it. He took me, you know, we went running together. He wore me out. He took me to his gym where he really wore me out. Like here, here was a guy who was absolutely living the lifestyle. And I have to say, you know, that's that's not always the case. Like there's there's a way in which people can become in this day and age influencers and start like backsliding, but putting up a front, like like sort of stunting that they're still totally representing the lifestyle when they aren't. And so it's really nice to get to know people and see, yeah, he is the real deal. And what about T. Colin Campbell? He has been um, somebody who I've had on the show, I believe now three times. And um, I just, I love getting to know him uh, for all the work that he's done, but then also just talking to him a little bit off the air and hearing about his upbringing and the fact that he's actually a, a pretty big Washington football to where now Washington commanders fan. Like I never knew that, um, you know? And, and so like, we kind of connected on that too. Like for somebody who has, reach the level of success that he has to be such a humble, soft-spoken kind of a guy. Um, I think that those things really don't go hand in hand too often with a lot of people in this world. And yet he's hitting home runs when it comes to that combination. What was your experience like with him? Yeah, it was exactly that, that, you know, first of all, he's a, he's a remarkable human being um, in that he, you know, threw away a lot of government funding and industry funding for his research because he didn't think it was the truth anymore. Like that took a lot of guts. And he's just a, he's just a pure scientist. He just wants to know what the truth is. And he doesn't care who gets you know their feathers ruffled when he's searching for the truth. But the other the other thing that I love is, you know, the China study came out in 2004. And he was already, you know, over 70 at that point. And he had kind of spent his career being marginalized at Cornell, um, fighting for, uh, for funding, doing a very good job of getting it, but still always an uphill battle, always having to couch his true um, intent behind, um, you know, sort of going after things that the, the, the funding industry and the NIH would find acceptable. Like he had to engage in, in some very thread the needle kinds of maneuvers. And so by the time he got famous, he, it kind of reminds me, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, and I certainly don't want Colin to take it the wrong way, but it's like the really ugly kid who grows up to be like super attractive. Like, <laughs> like deep down, they're always gonna be a little bit humble. Right, right on. 
Right. You know, like he, he was so unpopular in his world for so many years that, that and I, um, I kind of got to know him around the time the China study really started taking off, which was not till 2006 or so. 2007. It was several years after it was published that it really began having an impact. And like I, I, my family and I went to a book signing that he did in a Barnes and Noble in Germantown, Pennsylvania. Now, earlier that day, we attended a lecture he gave at the medical school. I think it was at Jefferson, um, maybe 100, you know, I don't know, doctors or residents or interns or whoever was was there um, asking mostly skeptical questions. And then he goes to this Barnes and Noble on his big book tour. And there are five people sitting, waiting to listen to him. And that includes four, my, the four members of my family and like a lady who sat down because she was tired. Mm. Like he was not, he, you know, it took him a long time to become an instant success. So like when the, the world started noticing and people come up to him now and I see them treating him like a god, like, you know, true royalty and knowing like who he is. It's I mean, it's very gratifying to see finally people giving him his due, but also knowing he's just a guy who did a bunch of studies and his his main positive qualities have just been kindness, curiosity and relentlessness. Like, you know, there's like there's something really nice about the fact that he isn't different from us. Uh, kindness, curiosity, and relentlessness, relentlessness. That's kind of like truth, justice in the American way. Right. So like, that's just the Colin Campbell version of, of kind of being Superman. And I'm not trying to raise, uh, you know, put this guy on any higher of a pedestal than he already is. Cause he, he's deservedly already up on the highest of pedestals. Um, just so many people who I've talked to celebrities and otherwise all just revere, uh, the work that he's done because they've, experienced it for themselves. I mean, I remember one particular conversation I had uh, when my wife and I were still working at the ABC station here in Washington, D.C. And Kevin Eubanks, the Tonight Show band leader, was a guest that particular morning. And my wife brings Kevin over and she's like, hey, honey, guess what? You know, Kevin's vegan. I was like, oh, that's awesome, man. Like, let's let's chat about it. And I'm like, so, you know, why, why did you make the switch? And he's like, well, I've read this book called the China study. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you over the years, how many people have, have said that to me. I mean, that's just one of the most impactful books out there. And then, you know, the gravity of it. And so when Colin asks you to work with him on whole, did you feel pressure there? Were you anxious? Were you hesitant? Like what kind of emotions were going through that dome of yours, man? Um, I wasn't nervous. Um, I felt like, and in fact, I was in the opposite of nervous because I felt like here's the guy with the goods, like he's got the ideas and all I have to do is sort of make it like a little bit more polished and entertaining. Um, like that felt easy. Like, you know, you worry when you're going to write a book with someone and you don't think they're very smart or they don't have anything to say or they're going to you're going to disagree with them. But for like to help Colin, like, I've you know, like the person I felt like the person who, um, you know, pulls the curtain open at La Scala, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like, the, you know, they're going to do a good opera. Um, what I what I was I mean, and originally he he had 17 chapters written and he just wanted me to edit them. And so he asked me, you know, kind of, you know, what could I do? I, I, I edited like four pages of chapter one, sent it to him. And he said, all right, this is great. Let's this is exactly what I'm looking for. By the time I got to chapter two, we both realized that the book needed to be what the 17 chapters weren't a book. They were 17 chapters that had been written, actually, standalone between 2007 and 2011. And there was a lot of repetition, as you would expect, and things didn't hold together. So what ended up happening was I went from um, an uncredited copy editor to a collaborator. And every step of the way, Colin would insist that, you know, I don't think we're paying you enough. Um, so it went from a, a set fee to a set fee plus a certain percentage of royalties. Then later on, he said, you know, this doesn't feel fair. And he gave me a higher percentage of royalties. And then as, as we're getting to the end, he says, you know, it doesn't feel fair 
that you're not going to be accredited author. I think your name should be on the cover. And honestly, the decision to put my name on the cover is what really gave me powerful entree to the plant-based community to be able to speak at veg fests and um, have, you know, be introduced to other important movers and shakers in the industry. And so, you know, every step of the way, not only was Colin sort of boosting my confidence by telling me how valuable he thought it was, it wasn't just words. He was, he was putting his money where his mouth was. And, you know, just like he's, he's never done a thing for, a, for money in his life. Like he didn't write the China study to make money. <laughs> right. Right. If he had, he would have put a damn recipe or two in it. Like everybody was telling him. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, can you imagine the, uh, the the China study with with 100 plus full color recipes in the back? Um, yeah, man. I mean, I have never heard that story, obviously, but what you described does not surprise me in the least, uh, based off of my interactions with him. Just such a humble guy, uh, love him to death. Um, I wish that we had more time, but I can't let you go, uh, Howie, without without also asking you about. Uh, what it is that you're doing to help other health coaches out there in the world. You're kind of like doing this training the trainer type of program with them right now. How does all of that work? Yeah. So I have a, uh, a coach training academy to help health coaches um, become more effective. Um, I also help like lifestyle medicine professionals, physicians, DOs, nurses, uh, dietitians, PTs, because in, in our field, we can't just like write a script or perform an operation and, and know that everything's going to be fine. We also, we are interested in lifestyle change and we're not most of, we're not very good at getting people to change lifestyle by just telling them what to do or by lecturing them or by giving them a list of documentaries to watch. Um, because even, you know, even, as you said, even like after playing ultimate Frisbee and knowing to knowing better, you still didn't have control over the behavioral knobs and levers in your life to actually make the change. So in, in my coach training, I train people to become wicked effective health coaches. Um, and, you know, there's, there's various uh, modalities and techniques that we use. And by the end, you will um, not, you know, not only learn how to help like people who actually come to you, but you're also going to be, get much better at just talking to people and being more impactful and influential because, you know, you're not going to be leading with advice, leading with telling them what to do. You're going to have a whole series of processes and steps to get people to take ownership over, over the health changes that they want to make. And you're going to guide them to, um, to learn from failure. Right now, the way we think about failure, the way we think like, oh, I'm, I had a taco or I messed up or I, I did X and I said I was never going to do X again. Most people think it's over and they give up and they, you know, we call it the what the hell effect. And instead, when you train people to think about those situations and those occurrences as fights and sometimes you win a fight, sometimes you lose a fight, but you can always learn from the fight then people can get up the next day and continue even if they've had what they consider to be a disastrous slip up. Um, and so I have, you know, a lot of the methodology is in a book that I wrote with my friend and coaching teacher, Peter Bregman. It's called You Can Change Other People. So if people just want to find out like what the, what the basic steps are. But starting in the fall, um, I have a training program and people can find out more about that at wellstartcoach.com. Wellstartcoach.com. We'll link off to that in the show description or in the episode notes for sure. And uh, also, I see over your shoulder uh, the book "Sit to uh, Sick to Fit." Can't can't wrap this up also without uh, giving a shout out to our boy Josh Lajani, who himself has one heck of a health transformation. One of my favorite guests and a, and a dear friend of mine as well. Um, I'm sure that you had an equally thrilling time getting the opportunity to work with him as well. Well, not not only did I learn a lot sort of intellectually from Josh, but he, he became my health coach. Oh, is that right? And without, without consciously knowing what to do, he was able to get me to like, I started running. He turned me into an ultra runner. He really helped me embrace 
in a physical, visceral way, the concept of discomfort. And that has carried over very profoundly to a lot of other areas of my life, to conversations that I, that I don't want to have, to situations that I don't want to be in, and realizing all the ways in which I was diminishing my life by trying to stay in a comfort zone. And his example and his friendship and his guidance have really changed my life. So writing Sick to Fit and the other book that we wrote together, Use the Weight to Lose the Weight, have just sort of cemented my relationship with Josh, where I'm just a better person every time uh, I'm around him. That's my dude right there. Josh Lajani, just salt of the earth, phenomenal human being. Uh, as are you, uh, Howie. Look, man, I would love to bring you back on the show in the future. I feel like there's so much more that we could talk to. Uh, we uh, talk about, we have so many people who are health coaches who listen to the exam room. They're part of the exam roomies, uh, whether they're a food for life instructor or they went through uh, Collins E. Cornell certification. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many people who really are trying to get that message out. And for you to be able to talk and, and to give some advice and coach them up, uh, that would be great. So maybe uh, close to the launch of your program, we can uh, bring you on here. We can talk a little bit about the basics and then um, really kind of hope, uh, you know, get some people coached up and, and ready for your coach training sessions as well. So would you be down to come back in the fall? Whenever you want me. You're a good man. You just, would... you just call out my name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll be there on the double, man. Uh, all right. Howie Jacobson, thank you so much. Thank you, Chuck. I really enjoyed getting to know you and uh, sharing these ideas. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.